Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining in this evening. My name is Varun Sanan. I'm the Zonal Head for Edelweiss Asset Management uh, from Mumbai. At Edelweiss, uh, it's been our constant endeavor to bring you up to speed with what's happening in the financial markets. And this call or this webinar today is around one of our existing schemes that we are running, the Edelweiss Greater China Fund. As most of you have seen over the last couple of years, uh, Chinese equities have been highly, highly volatile. And, uh, you know, mar market participants are now in that uh, phase where they're grappling to understand what's the way forward for the Chinese economy and the Chinese markets. As you're also aware, uh, the Edelweiss Greater China Fund feeds into the uh, uh, JP Morgan Greater China Fund, which invests across sectors in the Greater China region, which is China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. To make more sense of what's happening in the Chinese markets, uh, I have with uh, me Alex Treves. He's uh, coming with 25 plus years of experience. Uh, he's the managing director and the head of investment specialist team in Asia within the emerging market region based in Hong Kong. Uh, Alex, great to have you. Welcome to the call. And uh, I hope you're doing well. It is uh, past 6.30 in Hong Kong. We've got you in late evening. So thank you so much for sparing the time. For you, anything. This is my pleasure. This is where I want to be right now. But thank you. Brilliant. So let's jump straight in, Alex. Uh, you know, Chinese equities have been all over the place. We've been hearing a lot of uh, geopolitics around China. We're hearing a lot of stuff that's happened from 2021 with the government intervention in tech, edutech, uh, Chinese real estate, uh, giving people a hard burn. So let's start with, you know, what's happening in China? What is the outlook of the Chinese economy and the ramifications of that on the Chinese equity market? Okay, well, that's quite a broad question. And I think that, um, you know, it's worth reminding ourselves that China is a, a, a rapidly changing continental economy. And so a lot of the complexity you're talking about is just an inevitable part of dealing with this situation. Um, I like to manage expectations with all investors. And the first thing that I would manage expectations up front is if you're looking for simplicity and easy answers, I'm not sure that China is the... Um, it, it's the right place for you, but that's that's okay because this is what creates money making opportunities. Now, um, uh, Bruno, are you going to control the slide? So, yes, if we can go to, um, the first slide, please, uh, or slide one more. This is it. Thank you. Let's summarize part of what's going on in the greater China region at the moment. And as you've already said, this is a product which invests not just in mainland China, but in Hong Kong and Taiwan as well. But an awful what happens there is dominated by the mainland itself. So that's often what we talk about. So the first thing is that we believe the consumption recovery is underway. However, it's slower and more tentative than we had hoped and than the market hoped. And it's also somewhat partial insofar as there are some areas such as uh, services, so tourism or F&B, which we think are doing okay, and there are other areas, for example, larger ticket items, consumer durables, which we think will do less well. So maybe we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is a policy pendulum in China and it swings. And there will be times that the policy environment is quite tight. And this is what you would expect from a political society like China. And there are other times when the policy pendulum swings in the opposite direction and it becomes much more friendly. And we think that after a period in which policy has been quite restrictive, it's going to be much more pro-growth because growth is what China needs more than anything else at the moment. And so that's positive. And then valuations, as we will discuss, are pretty reasonable. However, it's not all plain sailing. The first thing is that property market weakness is feeding into a, a bigger underlying phenomenon, which is that people were sufficiently um, sort of burnt out or shocked by the lockdowns that it is taking the consumer a while to recover and then geopolitics of course will create noise for as long as we are working that's that's just something we have to get used to but of course that tension between the US and China can be unhelpful and actually it can create quite a lot of opportunity which maybe we'll talk a bit more about 
So what I what I pause there and see if there's anything you want to dig a bit deeper on. Yeah. So you know, give us give us a heads up on how is the recovery shaping up uh, post the uh, COVID uh, you know lockdowns. Now we hear that lockdowns have been lifted. Herd immunity is kind of setting in. We've seen from the rest of the world that once herd immunity sets in, it actually uh, you know gets life back to normal and consumer spending starts. So what's happening on all of those fronts? Uh, it'll be interesting to know because end of the day, the economy to come back on its feet needs those consumers to go out there and spend. Well, you're right. Now, now to me, this is a matter of timing. Uh, and, you know, timing is, is important in investment, but I would advocate patience. Now, the first thing is that COVID is no longer an issue in China. And I was there two weeks ago. And a couple of days before I got on the plane to go to China, I will tell you, um, I developed a cough. Now, I was quite intimidated. Before you go to China, you still do a rat test. You still have to fill in a form saying, I've got no symptoms, and I had a bit of a cough. And I was on the aeroplane, and I had a bit of a cough. And I was petrified. And I got there, and I managed not to cough in the immigration queue. And I went to the office, and I had a bit of a cough. And I said to my colleagues, I'm so sorry, but trust me, I've tested. It's not covid and every single person responded in the same way. They said, no one cares anymore. That's behind us. So COVID is not an issue. But I tell you what's an issue. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is a bit like the sort of the hangover of the COVID policies on the left. Um, there in India, each of you will have your, uh, your COVID horror stories or your tough experiences of COVID. But I don't think that anyone anywhere else experienced quite what our colleagues in China experienced which is that some of them were locked in the office for over two months. They were, they were unable to leave the office for two months. People were in their apartment compounds for over two months. People who got sick got whisked away and isolated. Now, you may or may not agree with that set of policies, but whatever your view on them are, what is meant is that people retain a sort of an, an after effect of that. It's taking a while for confidence to get going. And I think that's, not entirely surprising. China had such strong policies around lockdowns that it's taken longer than other countries for people to, to get their bin back, to, um, to, to, to redevelop uh, or to, 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 to regain their animal spirit. So on the left-hand side, you can see that consumer confidence has been rebounding gradually from a very low level. Now, I think that people generally are resilient, and I know that Chinese people are resilient, and I think that over time they're going to start spending again but it might take a while. Now, one of the reasons I think they will start spending is on the right-hand side of this slide. And what you can see is that uh, in China, not least because in COVID you couldn't go shopping, they built up a lot of savings. But of course, those savings in China, as in India, actually were unevenly distributed. So people like us, people with steady jobs, people who are earning a salary, people who are generating a, a comfortable income, they did okay. I mean, actually, probably their disposable incomes have risen over time because there was less they could spend things on and they carried on earning a salary. So they've done OK. They've saved. Conversely, gig workers or the young recent graduates, they're having a much tougher time. And so when we think about where the where this money will be spent, we think it's much more on um, on maybe higher end goods for affluent members of society. We think it's maybe people in their middle age, sadly, like me, who've got a bit of cash, less so the university graduates. We think it's likely to be leisure and services. People go to restaurants, people want to go on holiday, people want to engage travel agents, but they're less likely to go and buy a new apartment. And I think, again, this is universal. There in India, when you emerged from lockdown, you might have wanted to go on holiday or go to a restaurant with your friends. You are unlikely to have bought a new car. And I think China, is the same as that. Now, let me just um, uh, address one more thing on this, um, which is on the next slide. And this, this underscores a message that I've given already, that we do think this is about um, patience. It's about the willingness to consume picking up over time. Now, will it be in the next couple of weeks? I doubt that. But we do think that this is something which will, which will happen over the, the coming months. Sure. So. You know, given the fact that the recovery is going to be gradual, it is also, you know, like most countries when people come out and spend, uh, they will they will uh, spend a lot of the savings which are going to be front-loaded 
and uh, you know things will start picking up from there. But what are those key sectors or key growth drivers that you are witnessing now, which uh, make you you know very confident that the Chinese uh, rebound is underway? And also the fact that there's not going to be a next round of disruption from the government. So, you know, what are those uh, key themes or key, 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 key data points that help you understand that better? Okay, well, I think that um, ultimately what we, what we do is we try to, I think it's very, very difficult to manage a portfolio on the basis of individual macro data points, because that involves getting a huge amount of information and then trying to draw stock level conclusions off that, which I think is quite a perilous thing to do. I could, if I told you what next quarter's GDP number was going to be, would that enable you to find the best stocks to benefit from whichever environment? I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. Conversely, what we try and do is find the best companies which will thrive in a given set of circumstances. So what are some of the sorts of things that we're doing? Um, well, and we will come back to some of these themes. But first, as I've mentioned, we think that more affluent consumers in China will spend money on, on services. Uh, and on entertainment. And so we've been adding to some of our higher conviction liquor stocks, because of course people consume liquor when they go out and about, they consume liquor in social settings, they consume liquor in work settings as well. If they wanna seal a deal, they go to a restaurant and have a drink together. So we actually switched money from a stock called Sichuan Swell Fund, which is more of a, a middle market alcoholic liquor company, to another company, which is very famous, called Kuei Chan Maotai, which is the premium um, baiju, which is a, a Chinese liquor, the premium baiju manufacturer. We think they've got good brand equity, we think they've got good pricing power, we think their volumes will go up. And so that's something that we've added to. Um, we've been adding to some tourism beneficiaries. And so there's a stock called H World, which is a large hotel chain. We think people will travel, we think that will benefit from that. We've added to wider ways of exposing the portfolio to consumption. And so a stock like China Pacific Insurance, we know that Chinese people are underinsured. We know that they're going to be more focused on, on this in the future. Um, and so here is a stock that we have been adding to. But beyond that, there are other things in China which we, we, we feel very strongly about. Um, now, I've already mentioned geopolitics once, but let's go back to that. One of the consequences of geopolitics is that China wants to become self-sufficient in a whole array of areas where previously it used to rely on imports. And in India, you will relate to this, is that one of the key areas of self-sufficiency um, for any, any government is to think about energy self-sufficiency. And China imports energy. And so one of the things we think they will carry on doing is really trying to um, develop and encourage the carbon transition industry. So they're spending more money on solar, they're encouraging more electric vehicle pur purchases, and there are ways of benefiting from that. Um, and, and yeah, we can, we can have a look at the, the carbon neutrality slide if you would like, it's a good time to go to it. Um, but uh, another area we, we, we feel quite strongly about is on the previous page, actually, um, which is again, that the more that, um, the, the US pushes back on China, the more it will have to develop its own technology. And so in the semiconductor space, we continue to have exposure to stocks where China is becoming self-sufficient in, in these sorts of areas, which previously were dominated by, uh, by imports. And then the final thing I'll say for the moment is that AI is a hot topic in China as it is everywhere else. And we can't get through a conversation without talking about AI. And so there are some companies which we think will be beneficiaries. Um, there are other companies which we think will, well, so we might add to them. There are other companies which we think will be beneficiaries, but the share price has already more than factored that in. And so trying to distinguish who will benefit and, and who won't is quite important. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see we mentioned Kingsoft. Kingsoft is a bit like the Microsoft of China. So it's a homegrown office suite of software which Chinese people can use. That's clearly likely to be an AI beneficiary because it'll make its products that more efficient. However, we think a lot of that is already baked into the share price. So actually we've been reducing that a little bit. At the same time, one of the internet giants that we used not to own 
called Baidu seems to have made the first major step towards a sort of a chat GPT type product. So we've been adding to that. And in the background, we retain positions in stocks like Montage, which you can see on the left side of the screen here, which is one of the hardware manufacturers which will facilitate AI, however that, however that transpires. And so th those are some of the things we're looking at. And if I try and tie that together, you, you've asked me a number of questions which I would regard as being quite cyclical, but I think it's helpful in China as elsewhere. I should take a structural step back and say, well, in the longer run, where do we feel the most conviction? Because that, that's the best way to cut through the noise and, and just focus really on, on the key signals. Sure. Uh, Alex, we're hearing a lot about uh, the Chinese government's uh, you know, stimulus that is going to come through. Uh, in the next few months. Uh, if you could give us an update around what is the investment team thinking on those terms? Uh, are there any inputs that investors and uh, partners can draw from this, the impending stimulus that's going to come through? And how do you think that would really, really help the economy? Or what, what are the sectors that it would really come through in, which will uh, kickstart uh, the, the wheel again? Absolutely. Well, let's go to slide eight, please. Um, so I think and the, the first thing to say about stimulus in China is that there's room for lots of it. The, I think that the model in the past was very much around government intervention in China fueling a, bull, a boom bust economy. And particularly at times of economic pain, the government spent a lot of money on things like infrastructure. And that model is now, if it's not redundant, it's certainly massively diminished. So what you can basically see on this chart, uh, particularly um, in the middle, I would say, is that China actually responded relatively moderately to the challenge posed by COVID um, and didn't spend the huge amounts of money that we saw primarily actually in Western governments. So that's the first thing is there's lots of dry powder. The next thing, um, and you can see this on the left, is that Inflation in China is not an issue. So this, this challenge that we're seeing elsewhere, that we've got governments who might be a bit worried about the economy, but they're also worried about inflation. And so they're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. China doesn't have the inflation issue. So if they want to stimulate, they can. But I think we need to be very cognizant of a, a fundamental shift which has taken place in the Chinese government's way of thinking about stimulus. As I said, back in the day, the government would respond to any emergency by basically throwing money at the problem, building more roads and bridges and apartments and seeing what happened. And they don't want to do that anymore. So I think, much as I've advocated patience, the Chinese government is being more patient as well. They don't want to return to a situation of excess leverage. They don't want to rely on infrastructure and real estate investment in order to stimulate the economy. They want the that they want to rely more on new economy, innovation, growth, all those sorts of things. Now, let me give you a, a couple of numbers. China did cut interest rates last month by 10 basis points. They cut the one-year interest rate by 10 basis points and the five-year interest rate by 10 basis points. It is hard to come up with a sort of a, a milder, um, less spicy approach to stimulus than the 10 basis point cut. And I think that's sending a message about the, the pattern for the future. I think it will be, or we think, it will be incremental. It will be cautious. It won't be shock and awe. It'll be just out of the margin to send a message that China's open for business. It wants growth, but it doesn't want growth at any cost. And another example of something that China has done is it has extended subsidies for electric vehicles. Now, that meets more than one objective. It, um, it, is good for the consumer. It also ties into this, this, this theme I've already talked about, about carbon transition. It's going to support a bunch of in global industry leading companies. And so that's, I think, the sort of thing they'll do. We don't expect them to go out and have a massive fiscal package to build more bridges. It's not what China needs. Sure. So, Alex, uh, you know, clearly, uh, a question that's going to come to everyone's mind is after seeing Chinese equities go through you know an extended period of pain is the worst behind us and I think uh, 
it's a question that would probably put you in the spot, but I think it's also a great time to for us to speak about uh, where the valuations are at in terms of Chinese uh, equities. And, uh, you know, if you were to look at it very objectively, uh, would you want to invest in China right now? Or would you like to wait it out and see the stimulus come through and then invest? So what are your thoughts around that? Oh, well, I think waiting for the stimulus would be entirely the wrong thing to do. I think what you need to do is form a view on is this an asset class that you like or not? Not for the next three months or the next six months. Please don't do that because that's the toss of a coin. Yeah. But is this an asset class you want exposure to in the medium to the long run? And we'll talk about that. If it is an asset class you want exposure to, then we look at valuation and we decide you need to have some skin in the game. Waiting for stimulus, waiting for the good news to come through, um, I would regard that as being, with no disrespect to you, a, a fool's errand because by the time the good news is out, it's going to be in the share price and that's not what you want. Now, let's have a quick look at slide 14. We were here a, a few minutes ago, but um, if we just kind of think conceptually about China's place in the world, we know there are a lot of people in China. There are almost as many people in China as there are in India now. Congratulations, India, on overtaking China as the world's most populous country. And we know that a lot of those people are going to get wealthier. The middle class will keep growing. Now, it might not grow at the pace it was growing a couple of years ago or five years ago, but it will carry on growing. And that will create money-making opportunities. And so we've got that, that classic consumption story in the, the, the bottom right of this slide. But the other thing which is going on, and I can't, uh, I can't overemphasize this enough, is that in the, the generation that I've been working, the 28 years now, I'm afraid, China has gone from being a mass market manufacturer of relatively simple things for people like you and me to buy to being a genuinely innovative society. And if we just try and figure out what some of the emojis on this page look like, I mean, in technology, we've got, what's that, a computer screen, we've got a robotics arm, we've got a semiconductor. 25 years ago, China was not able to make its own computers. 25 years ago, China did not have a robotics industry. It had a, let's employ lots of people from the countryside industry. 25 years ago, China did not have any semiconductors it could make itself. 15 years ago, it didn't have semiconductors. Then we look at carbon neutrality. So that first emoji looks to me like an electric vehicle. No one in their right mind 20 years ago would drive a Chinese car if they had any alternative. Now you just might. I've been in a lot of Chinese cars recently. They're really good. In the middle, we've got a solar panel. China didn't have a solar industry 20 years ago. Now it's world leading a lot of components. And on the right hand side, we've got a plug growing out of a leaf. I don't know what to make of that. So let's skip that one. But the point of this is that China now makes a lot of innovative products, which it didn't used to be able to make. And the question you need to ask yourself is, would you bet that in 10 years time, China is making more innovative goods than now? or not. And my strong view is that it will. So you've got the demand side from Chinese people and Chinese corporates. You've got the supply side from innovation and technology. And you put those together. And to me, that feels like an attractive investment proposition. So structurally, I know how I want to be placed. Now, you're asking me a shorter term question around here, but why now? So let's go to slide 10. And we will look at the right hand side, price to book ratio. And what this shows you is not an expected return. This shows you a set of historical data points. So each of those gray diamonds is a point in history which has happened. And what the x-axis shows you is what price to book the market was trading on at each of those historical points. And what the y-axis shows you is what was your subsequent 24 month return from that price to book? So this is one way of thinking about valuation and upside from that valuation. And we are now around, give or take, you can see where that vertical blue chunky line is, around 1.3 times price to book. So what this tells us is that sometimes in the past, it's true, if you bought the Chinese market at 1.3 times price to book over the subsequent 24 months, you lost money. It's true, it's happened. But the vast majority of the time, if you bought at this price to book, or even at two times price to book, or even a bit higher than that, 
the vast majority of the time you made money over the next two years. So let's pull this together. The first thing I believe is that China offers longer term investment ideas. Because there's not because of the GDP number, not because of the, you know, the broader consumption number, but because there are companies here which make good things. And then the second statement is that at this, at this valuation point, it seems to me there's quite a lot of upside. It might not be next month, it might not be the month after, but I think there will be over time. And what we know about, well, we know, we know this is a volatile asset class. What we know about volatile asset classes is you don't sell on the bad news. Next time everyone calls you up and the market's been up for three years in a row and everyone's making lots of money and feeling, feeling happy, that's when you sell, not when the bad news is all in the price. Fantastic. Uh, Alex, so how I see this is uh, the Chinese economy is coming out of COVID. Uh, there is an impending stimulus by the Chinese government. The valuations are fairly attractive. And some of the themes that you have in China are probably very cutting edge, very innovation driven. And the Chinese consumer itself, uh, with the amount of money that they've saved up over the last uh, two, three years, uh, once they start going out and spending, the economy should start uh, coming back together and you should see some of that impact in the equity markets. Now, with that, I think it's a great time to dive deeper into the portfolio itself. You spoke about the three themes, technology, carbon neutrality and consumption. I want to speak about, uh, you know, I would uh, like you to speak about uh, tech because Chinese tech and American tech are very, very different. Now, mm -hmm. American tech is used everywhere in the world except China. So there is no Microsoft in China. There is no Amazon in China. And if we dive into the portfolio, what are those key uh, names or key themes uh, in the portfolio from the tech space that we're playing that we're very, very, you know, fundamentally bullish that should play out over the next uh, three, five years? Well, look, let me let me um, moderate a couple of your statements. Um, there is Microsoft in China. It just doesn't have a monopoly, and there are there are domestic um, competitors to it. And also, it's not true to say that no U.S. tech is used in China. There are plenty of U.S. semiconductors or components which are being used in China. But what's happening, of course, is that the U.S. is being increasingly nervous or cautious about sharing its fanciest, fanciest AI chips with China. If you want something fairly commoditized, that's available to you. But if you want the, you know, the, the real best of the best or something which could be militarized, then the, the US is much more careful about exporting it. So on the slide in front of us, we've got three themes that I've referred to already, but let me just give you um, a, a little bit more data. And We've got semiconductors, which we think is a, uh, a real beneficiary of self-sufficiency in China. We've got automation, which is important because the flip side of the increasingly prosperous and graying Chinese population is that they will need more of their manufacturing done by robots rather than by people. And then we've got software on the right. But let's jump please to slide 23. And I'm gonna go back to uh, actually, one of the opening comments, which is for all that pretty much everything I've been talking about so far has been mainland China, we also have a bunch of Taiwan in this portfolio as well. And Taiwan, of course, has got a lot of the best tech companies on the planet. So let's go down the left hand side and have a look at some of the, uh, the largest portfolio positions. So TSMC, let's start with that. Uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, is the best semiconductor company in the world without any debate. And uh, you, you, you drew the comparison between what's available in China or in Greater China in the US. I think that sometimes implicit in that is, this, is the fact that maybe the US is a bit better. In this instance, it's not. There's nothing in the US which can match up with what TSMC does. So that's a big chunk of the portfolio. And irrespective of what's happening in geopolitics, irrespective of how AI pans out, this is a company which we will think, think will benefit. Then we've got something quite different, and this is maybe analogous to a, more of a US company, but Tencent. Tencent, of course, is a social media and gaming company. 
It's a big chunk of the portfolio. It operates in, in mainland China. And this is an equivalent, I would say, of the US internet giants. And we do think that the, the regulator having been relatively tough on internet and other platforms for a while is going through a more relaxed period. If we go down a couple of rows, you've got Meituan. And Meituan is a leading food delivery um, company. And here again, we think that Chinese consumers over time will favor convenience over maybe cost. People will do more takeout. They will carry on getting food and, and meals delivered to their homes. Meituan is a beneficiary. This is the, the delivery of, uh, of China. You all know Alibaba. This is not just an e-commerce company, but the world's biggest e-commerce company. NetEase is a global, uh, a globally leading game developer. We've got some tech hardware and global unitship. Trip.com is an online travel agency, and JD.com is another e-commerce player. So if we put all that together, we've actually got geographic diversification across Taiwan and the mainland. And we've also got some business model diversification in both hardware, internet, et cetera. And um, I think that's, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting proposition. We've come a long way from Chinese companies making cheap transistor radios. Sure. Uh, there's another big theme that the portfolio is playing, which is renewable energy. And, uh, you know, I was reading the other day that China has world's leading solar power, uh, solar panel manufacturers. In fact, of the top 10 in the world, eight are Chinese companies. Uh, do we have some uh, uh, positions uh, in, in this regard in the portfolio? Absolutely. We've got solar companies. We've got EV supply chain, so electric vehicle supply and chain companies. We've got uh, enablers for, for the, the uh, the, the tech transformation of, of old China. So let, let's have a discuss a couple of these things. I'm going to start with Shanghai Biosite in the middle. Um, and this is an interesting company because it's basically a spin off of Bao Steel, which is China's most impressive steel company. And Biosite is a, a software or a systems company which helps other businesses, primarily in steel, make their manufacturing processes more efficient so they're less polluting and they spend less money. So that's a good thing. Um, and that plays into carbon transition. And then the purer carbon transition, I would say, is on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so solar and EVs. And the key here is to distinguish between units and pricing power. Now, as you've said, China already has this huge solar industry, and China already has the world's largest EV market, market for electric vehicles. The problem is that being the biggest doesn't mean you're making the most money. What you've got to do is figure out where the pricing power is and what things are getting commoditized. So in the solar space, solar panels are getting cheaper. That's driving volumes. The cheapness of solar panels in and of itself is not attractive to us because the volumes are going up, but the margins are going down. And so some of the solar companies are making less money. However, if you supply the nuts and bolts to the solar companies, for example, the film which protects the solar panels, then you're not affected by that diminution in the price of the solar panels. You're just getting all the upside from the higher volumes. So that's what we're doing in the solar space, is we're looking for companies which are benefiting from the big volumes without getting squeezed by the lower prices. And something similar is happening on the right-hand side. Um, so, electric vehicles. Now, let's have a look at what these, these lines mean. So we've got the historical number, which shows how many EVs, or the, the, the penetration rate, 4%, then 6%, then 14%, it's going up quite quickly. The, what's that, uh, the, the kind of the medium blue line was our analyst previous forecast for what the penetration rate will be. And then that cyan or light blue or whatever is kind of Tiffany color, line is showing the, the analysts' new forecast. And what you can see is that penetration rates for EVs in China are going up hugely faster than we thought was previously possible. What's not to like? I'll tell you what's not to like. One reason they're able to achieve this is because there is very fierce competition and cost cutting. 
And the other day I got into a, an EV in China. It was a brand I'd never heard of. It was a six-seater gullwing car with massage in the middle chairs. It had a big screen. It didn't have a rear view mirror. It had like a rear view screen with high-res cameras. It was one of the most advanced cars I've ever been in. And I refuse to believe the manufacturer was making a single penny out of having sold that car. But the more cars you sell, the more glass you need. The more EVs you sell, the more batteries you need. So uh, Ningbo Tupopo is a beneficiary of more Tesla sales, for example. So it's a bit like solar. We're avoiding the companies which are achieving volumes by cutting price to the bone. And instead, we're benefiting from the, company which, the companies which supply to them. So that's how we play carbon neutrality. Sure. Let's go to let's go to a different uh, set of questions now. And uh, you know we've understood that uh, probably the the time is right to invest into Chinese equities. A lot of uh, you know what uh, was uh, lining up as pain is easing out now. Uh, the portfolio looks spectacular. In fact, uh, placed uh, beautifully to you know benefit from this recovery. But at the same time, you know, there are these underlying risks in China as well. The geopolitical risk is a big one, and I'm sure the investment team uh, uh, can't really control that. But what are the other risks uh, that the investment team is, is looking at, and how are they getting addressed? Okay, well, look, life is full of risk, and investment portfolios can be full of risk, and it's up to each individual how they manage that. So I think we should say up front, this is a volatile asset class. If you don't like volatility, then uh, with all due respect, this isn't the asset class for you. That's the first thing. The second thing, however, is that risk and volatility create opportunity. And if you have a disciplined investment process, then when everyone else is panicking, that's when you can try and take advantage of good companies at the right valuation. That's the next thing. And then the third thing I would just say about risk generally is um, no one is arguing that this should be 100% of your portfolio. And please, can it not be 100% of your portfolio? That's the wrong thing to do. But for an investor in India who's probably got quite a lot of exposure to Indian equities, which are typically positioned in quite different sectors, and who wants a bit of geographic diversification, some business model diversification, exposure to something different, should this be a small part of your portfolio? Absolutely. So we mitigate risk through diversification. We all know that. And I might, I might come back to the second thing in a moment. But what else is out there? Well, the first thing is that maybe we see disappointment in the economic growth rate. We've discussed this for a bit, and I'm sure there'll be lots of newspaper articles fretting about the fact that the Chinese growth rate is going to be slower in the future than in the past. But I'm okay with that. Because as long as we can find businesses which will succeed, irrespective of whether the GDP number is 4.8 or 5.3 or 5.8, then we can make money out of that in the longer run. I think that the geopolitical things that we just have to get used to, and it will ebb and flow. But again, the whole self-sufficiency argument is a beneficiary of geopolitics, not suffering. I think the next thing we should say is that China is a highly regulated economy. And for all that, the regulators have been directed to be more pro-growth for the moment. I'm absolutely sure that at some point in the future, they will come back again. And so we need to be very careful about how we manage our risk around regulation, make sure that we are trying to invest in companies which, are, which have got tailwinds by being aligned with China's policy priorities, rather than being in anything which might cross one of the red lines for the Communist Party. And then another risk, which we haven't mentioned yet, is corporate governance. Uh, China is a relatively young capital market. Corporate governance often isn't as good there. China is a market which is also dominated more by state-owned enterprises. One of the wonderful things to celebrate about the Indian stock market is how large and thriving the private sector is. Governments often aren't very good custodians of minority equity capital. And China is a government dominated economy and stock market. So again, we just need to be careful there, but that's why we've got, in fact, let's have a quick look at the slide. Let's have a look at um, slide 20. That's why we've got all of these dedicated analysts based in greater China, 
just trying to understand this stuff. And we've recently completed the 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 the, the takeover of a company which was called CIFM is now Asset Management China Limited, JP Morgan Asset Management China Limited. And if you can see those square boxes on the right hand side, one row up from the bottom, we've now inherited about um, 20 analysts sitting in Shanghai, in addition to 15 or 16 dedicated greater China analysts that we had already. So we've got a lot of experts on the ground looking at this. Um, Let's have a quick look at slide 22, because I want to come back to the diversification point for a moment. As an Indian investor, one of the things you're asking yourself is, well, I've got so many good things to invest in in India. Why would I bother going to China? And the, the, the first answer to that is you never put all your eggs in one basket. But the second thing is that India doesn't have a monopoly on good companies. And if you are an Indian investor, you've probably got a lot of money in large, successful financials. You might have some... IT services companies, so TCS or Infosys, you're likely to have some large consumer staples companies, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, maybe shampoo or detergent, or maybe biscuits or beer. Conversely, if we, if we look at what you've got in China, well, IT or greater China, IT, this is tech hardware. This is TSMC. In India, if you've got IT, you've got tech services. In Greater China, you've got tech hardware. Then we've got communication services, and this is a fancy name for internet stocks. Again, in India, you don't have as much choice in the internet world. You don't have a Tencent and a, a NetEase and a, um, uh, you know, et cetera, the, kind of the, the uh, Meituans and the, and the JDs, et cetera. Then we've got consumer staples. And as an Indian investor, you will have consumer staples, but they're somewhat different. You might have tobacco, depending on your preferences. You might have biscuits, you might have beer, you might have shampoo. In China, you're more likely to have soy sauce, highly alcoholic liquor, et cetera. And then just on the other side of, the, uh, of, of, of that continuum, some of the best banks in Asia are in India. That's not a claim I would make about China. So in China, we are underweight financials, where in India, typically people are overweight financials. So I think this is quite a complementary asset class for all that it has risks to what you might have already. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to go to one slide, one last slide around, uh, you know, the past performance, uh, because people would like to see that. But uh, participants, uh, I, I think it's a good time to post your questions in the chat window. And we will take them up, uh, whatever your questions are around, you know, uh, what's happened in China or uh, uh, on the Greater China Fund, we should address them. So please put them up on the chat window. Now, Alex, I see calendar year performance. And what I can clearly make out of this is, like you've been mentioning all along, Chinese equities are highly, highly volatile. Look at, uh, you know, this period of 2015 and 16 where no returns were made. It got followed up with fantastic returns in 2017. And then you had the trade war of 2018, where markets uh, went down as much as 30, 32%, and the year ended at about 23%. And then you had a fantastic 2019 and 20, and we we all know what's happened in 21 and 22. Uh, and I also take your point as, uh, you know, since China is so volatile, investors should look at investing into Chinese equities in a very systematic way. I also take your point that this is not the right time to pull out of Chinese equities. Rather, if you have the opportunity, you should add into Chinese equities, given where they are. Uh, but my question to you in all of this is, uh, uh, is it uh, is our hypothesis correct uh, that uh, you know if you have to invest into Chinese equities, do a systematic investment over the next uh, twelve odd months, or is that a very elongated time period? Oh, I, I think twelve months is a very short time period. Um, I mean, you, you've summarized this, this slide exceptionally well because there are, there are only three takeaways from this slide. The first, as you've said very clearly, this is a volatile asset class, and History tells us if you sold when everything was going wrong, you live to regret it. The real question is why aren't people selling when everything's going right? But that's somehow, that's when people seem to buy the most. 
So that's the first thing. The second thing is that for all of that volatility, since launch in this product, you've made over 9% a year in US dollar terms. Now I'll, I'll take that, I'll take that. You know, I, I, that, that to me is not a, a, a shabby return in the longer run. And then the, the, the final takeaway is, although the last year or so has undeniably been disappointing and painful, when we've underperformed in the past, we have made it up subsequently. And again, if we look at the, the light blue bar about halfway down the page, which shows the cumulative excess return over time, despite the bad news, um, if we just go up sort of to the, the, the light blue bar, that's it there. Annualized over 10 years, net of fees, we've still made just under 250 basis points of, of outperformance. I think that, I think the idea of a systematic savings plan is a very good one for the extremely simple reason that all of us, all of us red-blooded human beings, when the news is bad, we get emotional and we worry. And when the news is good, we get emotional and we're ecstatic. And that's a really bad way to invest. And there are not that many people who can take the emotion out of investing and be really sort of cold-blooded and only invest when things are falling. And so a systematic savings plan imposes that discipline on you because I think it's really hard to do it yourself. And the media, I'm afraid, are entirely complicit in confusing all of this because they just inundate our screens with by amplifying whatever's going on and it just makes it even harder to keep a, a cool brain when you need to. Fantastic. Uh, Alex mentioned this uh, in uh, US dollar terms. I'm going to speak about uh, performance of the fund in Indian rupee terms. So since inception, the fund's given you close to 10%, which is not bad given the fact that the Indian markets or the Nifty has given you 12% and Nifty has been on steroids for the last uh, couple of years. So, you know, even after this big, big uh, drawdown in China, it's still uh, not far, far away from what Nifty has delivered. And that point about diversification and the different set of companies that the Chinese market uh, represents, uh, you know, will help you build a better portfolio. So with that, let me jump into Q&A. And I have uh, quite a few questions that have come in, Alex. Uh, the first one is actually a very straightforward one, which is what is happening with the tech stocks in China now since they've crashed so much? And is the recovery and the rebound back both in terms of stock price and in terms of earnings for some of these companies, because the regulation uh, that came through about a uh, year and a half back has put uh, or disrupted the business model for quite a few of these businesses. Yeah, well, well bless you for that question. Uh, let's go to slide nine because we have something we have something which answers this. I think the I've I've said enough times already that China is quite a regulated society, so we just need to accept that. Having said that. I think that China sometimes gets a bit of a tough press around the way that they regulate or the degree of logic. If we go back four or five years, internet companies in China were getting away with business practices which were not acceptable anywhere else. And so quite a lot of the initial regulation around anti-monopolistic behavior or treating data properly or not arbitraging between different regulatory regimes was simply around imposing a fair playing field on companies which had probably been taking the mickey. So the pendulum swung, but it didn't swing in a totally unreasonable way. A lot of what happened was fairer than many pundits will give China credit for. The communication was kind of sharp elbowed or blunt, but the underlying motivation was, was not unfair. Now, maybe it went a little bit too far, but there have been a couple of unintended consequences of this. And on you can see one of them uh, on the left-hand side here is that because of this squeezing, it made life tougher for some of the internet companies. And so they took the opportunity to get their houses in order. And what you've seen is that actually margins for a number of these companies have got healthier, not less healthy. So as we see any uptick in revenues, Operational leverage tells you that that will feed through nicely into earnings. And there are some, still some really impressive businesses here. 
The valuations have come down, the profitability has come up, the regulators backed off. We are overweight a number of the internet companies. And when I went through the top 10 holdings earlier, it will not have been lost on you that nearly half of them actually were Chinese internet companies. So we, we see opportunity. Fantastic. Uh, the next one's uh, another very blunt one. Uh, why is, uh, or what are the fund flows uh, from foreign institutional investors into China looking like? Are they, okay. are they investing, are they still investing in China or they have backed off? Sure. So we are a, we have one of the leading market positions in Chinese equities for offshore investors, which is say investors outside mainland China. So I think we're a pretty good barometer for what's going on. Year to date, we've seen inflows into China, but the majority of that happened in the first quarter of the year. And since then, I would say that people have been just holding back to see what happens next. Doesn't mean I endorse that approach, but that's what we've seen. But we still have net inflows year to date. The next thing to say is I think that you need to distinguish between the geography of the end investor. American investors have more philosophical issues with investing in China at the moment. I think that is at the, the nub of the geopolitical pressure. And I think that particularly institutions or government-rated institutions in the States are just holding back because this is a tough one for them to justify. In Europe, people are more balanced and there is still a lot of interest in increasing China weights over time, but there are some people who are more cautious, some less so. In Asia, conversely, I think there are very few people who ask themselves the question, is China investable? It's this kind of funny thing we hear, is China uninvestable? Of course, China's not uninvestable. China's totally investable. Um, in Asia, people get that. It's just a matter for them of timing. So I think it depends a bit on geography. Sure. Uh, the next one's uh, a simple one to answer probably, but a very relevant one as well, which is why, is the world giving so much importance to China? Because it's big and growing. Because it is the world's second largest economy. It does have a lot of people. It has a, an outsized geopolitical impact. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, which reminded me that China has got a border with 14 other countries, including the one that you're all sitting in. Um, and so for sure it matters to all of us, and hopefully it matters in a positive way, but no development path is um, is totally smooth, and so there'll be some hiccups as well. And a follow-up to that one, uh, with so much negative uh, geopolitical relations uh, with many countries that China has built, uh, how do you think that, uh, you know, these countries will want to do trade and business with China? Will that not have an impact on a few businesses in China? It will have an impact. It will absolutely have an impact. And there are some areas which um, we can't invest in. For example, um, anything which relates to what might be going on in, with uh, national security in, in, in the Northwest in Xinjiang is an area that realistically we can't invest in. But I think that most people or most governments ultimately need to get a balance right between the political philosophy and economic considerations. And China is inextricably linked with the rest of the world's economy in a way that, frankly, someone like Russia isn't. And so I think that no one can afford to ignore China. People might worry about some of what goes on, and there'll be some points of tension, but no one can ignore it. Still, an outsized share of what we all own is manufactured or has supply chains somewhere in China. And so I think that people will continue to engage with it. Makes sense. Uh, the next one's uh, around uh, Taiwan. Now, Taiwan makes uh, the most uh, innovative, cutting edge semiconductors. What are the other businesses uh, that uh, you know represent a good opportunity to invest in Taiwan? Okay, well, and the Taiwanese market is broader than just tech hardware. There is a banking sector, there are telcos, there are consumer stocks like 7-Eleven. Um, and I'm sure there are some other things that I have forgotten. But actually, 
in this strategy, the vast majority of our holdings are in tech hardware. Now, tech hardware is a broader space. It can be TSMC, which of course doesn't design semiconductors. It just makes them on behalf of other people. We've got server companies. We've got um, different parts of the supply chain. There's a, a stock called WeWin, which has got 100% of its revenues go into servers which are used in cloud computing, AI, internet service providers. There are, there are things like that. So it's not, it's, it's a much more, I don't want to say esoteric, but it is a, there are, there are many parts of the supply chain. It's quite fragmented. And so we, we just look across all the different parts of that and try to find opportunities. But the majority of it is in tech hardware. There's a question around uh, Chinese real estate. Uh, has uh, that been, uh, uh, you know, come to an end? Uh, do you see more uh, real estate companies going bankrupt in China? What's the government's uh, stand around, you know, supporting some of these businesses? And a lot of investors who've invested in real estate uh, are 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 they so low on confidence that they are not going out and spending? And your that's, view on that? That's that last point. I think is the key. That's a very, very important point. Now, there are two pieces of government philosophy that we need to understand. The first is the notion that real estate is for living in, not for investing. So the government doesn't want real estate to be an area of mass speculation. They want it to be for accommodation, which I think is not unreasonable. The second thing is that no real estate company is sacrosanct. And that's fine. We can't ask China to have more of a capitalist approach and then complain when low quality businesses exit the market. That's how capitalism works. But what's very important is that even if the companies disappear because they're run badly, is that consumers get the apartments that they put down payments on. So that's what the government really cares about. People get their flats and people live in them, they don't speculate on them. So I have got absolutely no doubt that more real estate companies will go out of business, and I'm fine with it. I think the key is we don't think it's systemic, we don't think it's going to undermine the banking system, we don't think it's going to turn into some massive bust. We do think, however, that some of the slightly lukewarm consumer sentiment we're seeing at the moment is related to some of what's going on in the real estate market and it's something that we need to watch but that is a that is something to be aware of rather than something to be paranoid about alex i know it is past 7 30 at uh, where you're at but uh, i'm gonna ask one last question before you know we sign off uh and this question's uh, come multiple times. We've been trying to, you know, not go straight to it, but uh, there's so many uh, people who've asked this one, which is uh, uh, if TSMC, uh, you know, looks like a big weight on the portfolio, it's still looking as an underweight position when we look at the portfolio in terms of, you know, how it is uh, positioned against the benchmark. Uh, why is it an underweight position? Also, uh, given the fact that the world is, uh, you know, thinking big around AI, what does it do for TSMC's growth? Uh, does it does it spur TSMC's growth into the next big giant uh, company, or what are your sure. thoughts on that? Sure. Okay, so there's a technical element to that, and then there is the um, the the investment angle. The the, the, the JP Morgan Fund's Greater China Fund is a Luxembourg fund, it's a CCAV. And one of the rules for CCAVs is in order to prevent excess concentration in any individual stock or position, there is a 10% cap in the portfolio on how much you can hold of any individual name. So we are not allowed by the rules to have more than 10% of the portfolio in TSMC. Now, the maths of this slide is that if the portfolio weight is called at 10% because it's because uh, that makes the math easy for me, and the relative weight is minus 3.48, is that clearly TSMC is about 13.4, 13.5% of the benchmark. But we're not allowed to hold that much in it. So we hold as much as we're allowed to by the regulator, but unfortunately we're forced into an underweight position. The way we get around that is finding other stocks not like 
TSMC, but a name like Global Unichip, which we think is a, an equally robust company with a good business model, which means we can still have our tech exposure even if we can't get it all through TSMC. Now, if we have a problem with that, we need to go and speak to the Luxembourg regulator, but I don't think they're going to budge. As for what AI means for TSMC, I think this is really interesting because we've all got a view on AI, but if we're honest, none of us really know who's going to make the most money out of it, which service. In fact, if I was a betting man and if I was allowed to, I would bet you money that a lot of the companies which will make the most money out of AI in the future are businesses we haven't even heard of yet. This is something we see frequently. One of my colleagues reminded me of this the other day, and I can't remember whose law it is, but the law or the rule is that big tech disruption is often overestimated in the short run and underestimated in the long run. And if we think about the dot-com bubble in around 2000, there were all sorts of nonsense business models which were being hyped up to ludicrous valuations. So they were being overestimated in the short run. In the long run, I think very few people at that point understood exactly what the internet was going to do to all of our lives. AI will be the same. We just don't know how to monetize it in terms of the services. But what we feel with very high degree of conviction is irrespective of which companies will be selling you their AI services, they're going to need the hardware behind the scenes to make it all work. Smart fridges, they need semiconductors. Smart cars, they need semiconductors. Increasingly sophisticated mobile devices, they need semiconductors. Any natural language processing system, that needs semiconductors. The, the fact that I can talk to all of you through the ether on you know, cameras and screens and this and that and devices, this uses semiconductors. And I don't think that anyone on this call thinks that we're going to take a step back from that. So TSMC and its peers will be beneficiaries of that, irrespective of which software or service company makes the most money. Makes sense. Makes absolute sense. So with that, I have no further questions, me, but this has been a very insightful call. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time out, Alex. And thank you, everyone, for participating. We've uh, uh, had a had a great uh, participation uh, today for this call. If you've got any further questions, or you know you've got uh, investment uh, things that you need to get done, please do reach out to your relationship manager in your respective geographies, and we'd be happy to help you. So with that, uh, have a great evening ahead, and thank you so much for joining. Bye bye. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.